Today's scripture reading is from Mark 11, 12 to 26. Mark 11, 12 to 26. Hear the word of the Lord. The next day, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves, because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him. For they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. When evening came, Jesus and his disciples went out of the city. In the morning, as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the, tree, the fig tree you cursed has withered. Have faith in God, Jesus answered. Truly, I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea, and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them, so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. The word of the Lord. It is good to be dear church. Uh, church, I pray and hope that it has been abundantly clear thus far uh, why we gather each week this time. Uh, we have been singing uh, through the musical worship, uh, even through the announcement, through the prayer. We have been exalting, crucified, and risen Savior Jesus. And as I was singing and hearing people pray, praying together, Oh, my heart has been stirred up. I pray that God will continue to stir up our hearts as we embark the journey on the Word of God today together. As a church, we have been walking through the book of Mark since the fall, all the way down through the suffering, all the way through suffering, all the way through spring. I guess I am thinking about suffering. Spring is not a suffering. Spring is great. <laughs> And through it, we have been talking about what it means to truly follow Jesus. And we will today continue to do that. So what does it look like, having always said that, what does it look like for you to follow Jesus today? I mean, it seems like you're doing well. In the end, you're here this morning, isn't it? But you being here, let me ask that. Is the genuine extension of what has taken place inside of you? Or is this just external conformity out of what's expected out of you? What is going on? Whether you are here to explore what Christian faith is all about out of curiosity, or you are here because you know crucified and risen Savior, whom we have been proclaiming, I think... Today's text will challenge us to examine whether there's any discrepancy between your public persona and your true self. In other words, is there any discrepancy between how you portray yourself to be out in public, you're here, or is this a genuine extension of who you are in Christ Jesus? Today's text will cause us to examine that. And especially if some of us are gathered here, if you proclaim Jesus to be your personal Savior, and He is primary meaning of your life, but you're actually taking advantage of others, it's all about your public show, why you don't really care 
while there's a huge disconnect between your private life and public life, I think Jesus will have pretty harsh words for you. I sometimes wish I can just give you gentle words, but today's text will have a pretty difficult word that Jesus abhors that. Sometimes we go through emotion, there is fruitless religiosity, fruitless business. And as we dive into this text, I pray that God will reveal what is within us and gently correct us so that we can walk along with how Jesus has called us. So let's examine three realities of life today. First, through this text today, we will see the fruitless life. How does the fruitless life look like? What does it just look like to go through all the motion that is empty inside? And secondly, we will examine then how does actually fruit bearing life look like? All right, in this text, we will see that sometimes our lives can look like very fruitless. And then secondly, we'll talk about then how does the fruit bearing life look like? Third, lastly, then how to change, right? How to move, for, move from fruitlessness to fruitfulness. We will examine the three reality. And don't worry, if you don't know the metaphor I'm using, I am not saying, I talked about fruit, I'm not saying y'all should be gardener. This is just metaphor that we'll see from the scripture that becomes abundantly clear. A couple things to note as you dive in first. You just already heard about this fig tree and all that. Now, out of all that we have been studying thus far uh, in this book of Mark, everything that Jesus comes to encounter Everything that Jesus touches, he brings death to life, from ill to heal. Like sick are healed, raising seas, calmed, blind, sees, death speaks, and the dead are raised to life. But today is the only miracle recorded in canonical gospel where Jesus does not bring ill to heal, but he brings destruction, not restoration it's a puzzling text what is this text all about that we are about to see and on top of that you might have noticed it and you're reading it when you look at today's word in mark chapter 11 it would be a great idea to have the word open because structures is quite per like it's puzzling when you look at it in verse 12 to 14 here jesus looks at the fig tree and jesus curses at that tree he's like hey do not bear the fruit anymore and after that, Jesus goes to the temple and then flips the table there. And then Jesus gets out of the temple. He sees a tree again and tree is dead. And Jesus tells the disciples, have faith, pray more. I'm like, what is going on? Is John Mark, who's writing this account through the eyes of Peter, is John Mark having ADD moment? He doesn't know how to structure that. So he goes back and forth. Is this all random account? Fig tree, temple, fig tree, have faith more. Or is this the story that Mark is trying to tell us? This fig tree that we see today, this is not a random account that John Mark has piled it together. Through this, fig tree becomes a perfect metaphor of what was going on in the life of Israelite, especially those religious establishment. What I mean by that, let's dive in together. So first, what does the fruitless life really look like? You will see that here in this text. Look verse 12. The next day, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to find out if he had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And when Jesus comes back, because he pronounced malediction here, it's withered and died in verse 19 and 20. Wait, what is going on here first when you look at it? I mean, Mark clearly tells us there's leaves. Fruit doesn't come typically. And it was not the season for figs. So, of course, figs will not be there. And Jesus curses that tree. Now, I mean, when you look at verse 12, it shows kind of humanity of Jesus, right? It says Jesus is hungry. I don't know why I find this so endearing. Maybe because I'm always hungry. I don't know. Jesus is hungry. And yet he's angry. He just cursed that tree. So, is Jesus hangry here? Uh, maybe second service of people will be always hangry when I <laughs> preach more. 
well, what is going on here? Like some scholar, some atheist scholar, this British mathematician who wrote a book, Why Am I Not Christian? He calls this vindictive fury. I cannot trust this Jesus. He's just angry. There's no virtue to emulate. Is that really what is going on in this text? I think not. It is not. What is happening here, you've got to understand Middle Eastern fig tree, how it actually operates in order to really understand in a sense, this Middle Eastern fig tree bears fruit before bearing fruit. What I mean by that, of course, there will not be a ripe fig. It's out of season, as Mark tells us. But during the times of spring, when the leaves begin to come, like, like nowadays, when there's buds that begins to blossom, when there's leaves on a fig tree, before the fig comes, there's this little nodule, a little knobs that grow out of that at the same time that was very delicious and nutritious for you to eat. So if you look at the leaves from a distance, which Jesus sees, he goes because there should be the knobs and nozzle that is not fig, a little different, but quite not there yet. But that was delicious and nutritious for it to eat. But when Jesus sees that, it appears that there will be fruit because there's leaves, but there was no fruit inside. It was appearance was appealing, but inside in the end, it was completely empty. And it was the visible metaphor of what was happening in Israel. And throughout the scripture, sometimes fig tree is compared to Israelites often. Like hear what Hosea says in Hosea 9.10. When I found Israel, it was like finding grapes in the desert. When I saw your ancestors, it was like seeing the early fruit on the fig tree. They're talking about early fruit in the fig tree that Jesus is talking about. See how Israelites are compared to fig tree here. So in other words, this fig tree was only externally seems like it was the great thing, while internally it was just empty. It was fruitless in the end. That was the metaphor of what was happening. And the reality, really what was taking place in Israelites, you are about to see that in verse 15. With that background, look at verse 15. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. What was happening at the time? Here, Jesus entered the temple court, he said. And when you read verse 17, where Jesus answered, he says, Isn't this a house of prayer for all nations, he says, which means Jesus entered to Gentiles' court. Uh, there are many layers of temple court when you look at it. There's like outside a layer of temple. If this is the temple outside, the utmost out layer of the temple is Gentiles court. We are Gentile, foreigners who are not Jew are allowed to enter there. If you go a little bit inside the layer, there's a bunch of different court, like woman's court. If you go inside further, there's holies. When you go inside of inside, there's holy of holies. Only high priest is allowed. So it's all different layers. And Jesus is talking about this Gentile's court that Jesus is entering here. And this time, around that time, a whole lot of people gathered. Historian tells us typically Jerusalem was populated about 80,000 people. But during this festival time, this population will grow up to be like 300,000 to 500,000 people will come from all over the nation. This is a house for ethnos. The prayer, isn't this the my house, will be called a house of prayer for all nations, all ethnic, the ethnos, Greek word used here. So all different people come. And it was right and good thing as it was written in Exodus 30 to exchange money what is happening is this that when people come to worship at the temple they are not going to carry their oxen from all the foreign land they are not going to bring all the sheep carry them okay let me offer oftentimes they are to bring just foreign currency and as it was written in exodus 30 you are supposed to exchange the foreign currency to a tyrian shekels that was the right currency at the time but what was happening here that Jesus flips the table in the end, this kind of exchange was supposed to happen outside of temple court. But this was happening in the temple court where Gentiles actually offer up a sacrifice, where this was a place of worship, place to pray. Uh, this place became New York Stock Exchange. It was a Forex, foreign exchange fund exchange market all of a sudden. That where people are supposed to pray and worship, 300, 500,000 people they were just gathered, became money exchangers at that time. The house of God, where you were supposed to pray, became just merchant. And not just 
a merchant on top of that. When you look at verse 15 and 16, what happens there? He overturned the tables of the money chargers and the benches of those selling doves. What is happening? What was the doves at the time? Doves are especially prescribed a sacrifice and offering for those who could not offer oxen and sheep. So it's for the poor people, especially prescribed offering for poor woman. But these priests and scribes, history tells us they are surcharging all these people. Hey, they are the ones who certify the animal, whether it's clean. But Jesus gets so upset by these people because they are selling doves, making marketplace, taking advantage of all those who are poor, marginalized, Gentile, outsider. Historians tell us that one of the high chief high priests, he made a vocation out of having a dove coat, like bird's nest. Okay, I'm going to raise all the birds so that I can sell it at a high price. And Jesus is just not having it. Externally, this was great for Boone establishment. It was a great boon making all the money. Those religious people are the ones who are supposed to offer up sacrifice and help the poor. But rather than that, they were just taking advantage of all these Gentiles, all those poor people, all those women. And Jesus is just flipping the table for the glory of God. This kind of injustice was happening. They were not aiding, but hindering people to actually worship God. That's the exact fig tree is the metaphor. You look like you're doing great things. So much busy and activities happening. 300 to 500,000 people come. You think you're worshiping God, but actually you're not even aiding, but hindering others from worshiping God. And Jesus calls that hypocrites. Your external life just do not match what is really in you. So Chelton, is there any disconnect from your external life to your true self, your public persona? These priests and scribes are all the ones who are supposed to help the poor, but those doves, they are taking advantage of that, of the people, turns the temple to the marketplace, and they are the hypocrites. Externally, they are doing great, but internally, they are rotten. It's fruitless. They are taking name of the Lord and using the name to take advantage for themselves. Jesus would have often called those leaders hypocrites. What is hypocrites? It's, it's our word. Those ones, it's a theatrical word, actually. Hypocrite is a Greek word. Hypocrite means the one who acts on stage, the one who performs. They wear off mask. The so persona, you see only the mask, but true self, it's rotten. So are you putting up any shows in your life like those hypocrites? Externally, you're helping people of God. Yes, I'm here to serve you. Let me help you to get your sacrifice ready. How can I help you to worship while you actually exploit those who are poor and the marginalized? How do you exploit others in the name of the Lord? Whether it be, don't you love those kind of humble brag? It actually makes others look bad and make you look good. Whether it be backhanded compliments, whatever you do that tramples others down to make yourself look good, whether it be literal profit taking that was happening here, or whether it's just taking advantage of others, how do you portray yourself to be in public? You're at the church, you look great, you really do. But does your private life and no one sees really match your public persona? You're so busy, religious activities, all those hustle busts are happening in the temple court. But it was exactly opposite of what Jesus has intended. I know I'm having somewhat harsh words for you today, church. Uh, but Jesus flips the table here. I want to match that tone. If you're just consumed by profit-taking, if you're just consumed by your increase of reputation, how can I earn more? Thinking about it constantly, whether it be reputation or profit, disproportionately more than you're thinking about, how can I serve others? Then you might be tempted to take advantage of others for your own gain and for your own kingdom like that is happening here. So where are you today, church? Do you see, it looks like great things are going on, but internally, they're just empty, fruitless, actually hindering others to worship. That's how fruitless life looked like. You do all the great things. God, I'm here giving you all the money, giving you all the glory. I'm here on Sunday, yay. But in the end, your private life, when no one sees, you act like you're the king of the universe. 
You don't care whether you sin or not. The pleasure of the world, you say, oh, God will forgive me, whatever. It's, you might look great externally, publicly, but internally it is rotten. Now, the question is then, are you really bearing fruit today, Chelton? You see how fruitless life only externally look great? How do you know if you're actually really growing in the Lord? How do you know if the Jesus curses the fig tree? You look like there should be fruit, but there's nothing. How do you know then actually you are bearing fruit in your life today? What is some litmus test? How do you discern that? Let me give you five things briefly before we talk about actually what it looks like to bear fruit. Are you bearing for five things? First, you believe in, you know it's interconnectedness between your public persona and your inner self, talking about its interconnectedness, and you know fruit growth takes it slow. Interconnected, it's slow, growing slow. Third, it's unknowable in the present. Fourth, and yet it is certain and promised. Fifth, growing is interdependent with one another. I know it's a lot, let me walk through one by one. First, you know the interconnectedness of your true self and public persona. There isn't discrepancy, much difference, because you know that only fools think that there's difference. Your public self is an extension of your private self. Your confessional theology, where you say it, where you think about it, should match your functional theology, where you live your life. You say, I love Jesus, God is great, but when no one sees it, you're just thinking you're the king of the universe. How you sin, how you indulge in that. That's hypocritical life. You don't want that. You know the inner connection. You believe in that, that your true self should be what's shown in the public as well. And some people call that genuineness and authentichood. And if you're baptized spiritually, you know what's that called spiritual genuineness? It's called repentance. Why? Because while we know that there shouldn't be discrepancy between the two, we all know we have that. We all are hypocrites in one way. I mean, you really look great here. You're worshiping God. But deep down, you know, God, I say I love you, but things that I struggle with, what is that for you? What is the sin in you? You realize it's interconnectedness, and yet you realize the discrepancy in your life. So you repent in the name of the Lord. That's one characteristic of growing sign that you realize you fall short of that. So you learn to repent when you realize discrepancy. Second, also know that it's a slow process. In the end, it is Jesus who is in use botanical metaphor here. Machine can print things, 3D printing can print overnight, but fruit doesn't grow overnight. When you look some others, you say, oh, I think you're growing. Why do you say that? Because you cannot see the naked eyes. It tells over the duration of time. So it's so hard to see our hypocriticalness within ourselves. We feel like we are going through so much motion. But when we realize that I'm not where I'm supposed to be, sometimes it's really hard. But know that it's a slow process. Sometimes the person that you ought to be patient the most is you. Isn't it really like terrifying to see that, man, I'm struggling with the same thing that I struggle I'm struggling with my public persona. I just want to portray myself as amazing, awesome, to cover up my insecurity. Uh, whatever the sin is, isn't it hard for you to kind of witness the same sin over and over again? Know that if you really trust Jesus as your primary meaning of life and a savior, it's a slow growing process. He will make you in the likeness of Christ. How do I know that it's a slow process, yet it is happening? Because it's the third thing. It's unknowable in the present. It's only 2020 in hindsight when you're growing in the Lord. But if you are going through especially terrible time that it hurts today, trust that God is at work. When you look back five years ago, you say, oh, man, that was a terrible time. But I think I'm grown through that. It's unknowable right in the present. Like, but every one of us goes through that tear and heal process. When you work out, you kind of tear your muscle, right? What it is, you micro tear and you heal. That's how muscle grows. Likewise, if you are torn in your heart today, you say, God, am I even growing? I feel like I'm just struggling with the same thing over and over, over. Just trust that God is at work if you are facing disappointment in yourself today. 
if you are facing agony of your heart, finding troubles in life, and yet you are going to God about it to heal, you can trust that God is at work in you. You can imagine your future self more in the likeness of Christ bearing fruit. You just don't know it yet because you are facing so much pain and agony. So don't waste your pain and suffering today. It is unknowable in the present. It's, it feels much more like just painful, but we call it growing pain for a reason. He's using the pain to grow you, mold you, bear fruit, and yet know that it is certain, right? You are not saved by fruit, but true faith will bear fruit. In other words, you are never saved by fruitless faith. In the end, we call fruit of the Spirit, right? It doesn't say fruit of me. It's not I who bear the fruit. It's the Spirit in us at work on us to bear fruit in our lives. He who has begun a good work will see you through. And lastly, know that your fruit, how do you know that you're really growing in the Lord today? See, compare that the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5.22. It gives all kinds of gift. It talks about like fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. But Paul doesn't say fruit of the Spirit are those. The fruit of the Spirit is, meaning all those are interdependent with one another. How do I know? In other words, humility and peace must grow together. You think, if you think a proud person cannot possibly have peace, you know why? Why does humility and peace must grow together? All this, the degree may be different all out of nine fruit of the Spirit, but you all must grow in all of them in one degree or the other. Why? Because it's all interdependent with one another. Proud person cannot possibly have peace because proud person is constantly worried about like these people. How am I perceived in public? How am I shown by others? Or you are constantly worried about how you judge yourself. Proud person cannot be humble because they are constantly caught in their image. How others would think of me? How do I think of myself? You are constantly taking yourself to the judgment court of others, standard that's set upon you. You are constantly taking yourself to judgment court of you. Of course, you will be torn. So you cannot possibly have, proud person cannot be humble, but humility, the person who is humble, will bear the fruit of the spirit of peace. Likewise, self-control and joy, those all go together too, right? The reason why you're addicted to things addicted to the pleasure of sin, whatever you call it, is because you are not satisfied in Christ alone. You are going other things of the sinful things to satisfy you. If you are truly finding joy in Christ alone, you will have self-control. These are all interdependent on one another. So if you think you are growing in humility but not growing in any other fruit, they may not be humility but just counterfruit, counter, counterfruit, counterfruit. Yeah, it's the counterfeit. You're just finding external poise. You think you're really growing in joy, but you don't have any peace in your life. That's not really joy. It's just probably momentary and circumstantial kind of elation. Things are going well, so you just are happy. You can have a litmus test of those kind of gifts. Like know that it's interconnected. Only fools think your private and personal life are disconnected. Yet yeah, also... Be patient with yourself. It's a very slow process, painful process. It's unknowable in the present, yet God is growing you. If you are really plunging all your failures and suffering in light of God's grace. And then it is certain because he who has begun a good work will carry you through. And it, those fruit growth is interdependent with one another. That's kind of how you know you're growing today. So finally, third then, we talked about what does fruitless life look like, those bare external appearance but internally empty like the fig tree Jesus curses, like those Israelites in the, who has turned this place of worship as a foreign exchange fund market and taking profits out of those poor and marginal lives. It's empty, it's fruitless. You are just caught up in external conformity. That's called fruitless religiosity and business. We all have tendency of that. So how do you know we just talked about and how you're growing? And actually I talk about third. How do you grow then? Because Jesus gives answer in this text. 
Now, first, I want you to notice, first, how do you actually grow? Is a look to all-encompassing character of Jesus in our account. What I mean by that, do you remember last week's sermon, Charlton? If you're here, you might remember, Jesus enters Jerusalem in a mere donkey, right? This big king promised him comes, but he just rides in the donkey humility position where a servant and child rides. He's a humble king, meek king, weak king, vulnerable king. Yet, is that all Jesus is today? He stands up against the most powerful respect and flips the table in righteous anger. He's weak and meek, and yet he's powerful. You're like, how is this possible? Children, you are not a victim of your temperament. Fruit of the Spirit will give you the all-encompassing characteristics of Jesus. If it's your temperament, you're humble. If it's just your temperament, you're humble, and yet timid and insecure, you're in despair. If it's temperament, you're just powerful but arrogant, there's no self-control. But Jesus encompasses both. This temperament, you're not bound by your temper. When you're growing in the likeness of Jesus Christ, when you see the all-encompassing Savior who's meek, yet who knows how to flip the table, that characteristics of Jesus is promised to you because he who has begun a good work will see you through and through. First, look to Christ who's all-encompassing. And secondly, I want to harp on it here a little bit. Trust, ask, and forgive. How do you grow? How do you actually bear fruit in your life? Here, Jesus tells us verse 22 and 25. What does it say? Have faith in God. Truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in their heart, believes that they'll say it will happen. It will be done for them. Now, maybe some of you think this is positive psychology. <laughs> Believe it, claim it, it will happen. No, positive psychology believes in you, like how good you can be, and believes in the circumstance, things real well. This has nothing to do with believing in yourself, but believing in God who can move the mountains. Believing in God who can really change you. If you feel like you're just going through emotion and fruitless things, like, what am I doing? Look to Him. Have faith in God who can change you. Take eyes off of yourself. Your face. And secondly, ask him about it. Verse 24, therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. I think one of the things that we just don't get it, I think is the power of prayer. Church, I mean that. About six years ago, I was watching this podcast. Podcast? I don't know what it was back then, how it was called. Uh, many of you know the author and pastor named Francis Chan. Uh, he wrote the book called Crazy Love. He was talking about in his podcast how he was having conversation with his first daughter who was about to get married. And he was asking, how do you know? And how did you find him? Uh, how would you know that he's the one for you? Da, 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 da. And he said his daughter's answer really surprised him. His daughter just answered, Dad, I just want to hang out with the guy long enough to see how God answers the prayer. God answers his prayer. Francis was like, what kind of litmus test is that and then what francis realized growing up every time they would pray together as a family and every time whether god answered yes or no he would always go back to his daughter hey honey do you remember we prayed for our church member so and so do you see how god has answered your prayer let's give thanks for that he would do that every time maybe this is great parenting tip for you parents if you're praying with your family don't only just pray. When God answers, talk to your children how God answers, whether yes or no. Because that will increase our faith in him, knowing that he answers our prayer. Uh, you know, many of you know my nephew Tim who lived with me for two months. This seven-year-old was terribly afraid of darkness. <laughs> Every night as the uncle said, I'm, I'm, I'm worried. He would like cry because he's like worried about darkness. So he would always ask, come sleep with me. I don't like sleeping alone. It's so dark. So I would like lay down next to him for a few minutes. And he says, Uncle Jin, I had a nightmare last night. I'm scared to go to bed. And I'm like, well, let's pray about that. So we would pray. And like, God, I would pray for my nephew Tim that he won't have a nightmare. And following there, as I tuck him in bed, I asked him again, hey, did you have a nightmare, Tim? How was it? And then he would say, no, I was okay. And I would often tell him, we prayed about it, Tim, right? Let's continue to ask God to help us. 
I think it's a little thing. Do you really believe that? I, I'm not using prayer as it's a magic wand. Anything you believe, it will happen. But sometimes we are so cautious of that that we don't get to really ask him with faith. Pray about it, really. It is possible that God can change things through your prayer. You say, God, I am tired of myself. Go to prayer about it. Ask about it. A pastor named Tim Keller when people, I've heard him saying this multi, three for different interview. Interviewer asked him, what would you do one thing differently in your ministry if you were to change that? He would always answer, I would have prayed more. We are so caught in productivity of fruitless motion. What does it mean for you to take pause and pray in the presence of God? God, I am this way or that way, and I am just going through fruitless religiosity and motion. Can you change me? Yes, he can. Sometimes it's very ugly when God reveals what is going on inside of heart. But go to him in prayer and forgive here, Jesus says, as Jesus has forgiven us, we also forgive others. And finally, I want to end with this church. I just talked about it. First, how do you actually grow? Look all encompassing character of Jesus. But if you only see Jesus as your role model, but not as your advocate. He will crush you. You see that Jesus is excellence, his compass, his humility, and both power. But if you just look at his role model, oh, I should be like Jesus, but you don't know Jesus as your advocate and savior, the burden will crush you because you will find discrepancy in your life all the time. God, I should be this, but I am this. I am still angry. I am still frustrated. I am still indulging the pleasures of sin in this world. What do I mean by see Jesus as your advocate in this text? Traditionally, Jewish people believe that when the Messiah comes, he would purge out the court of Gentiles. He would get rid of the place. But instead of Jesus getting rid of the court of Gentiles where Jesus enters, Jesus advocates for them. Jesus advocates on their behalf. Jesus actually goes against all the powerful religious leaders to advocate for those who are poor, who are marginalized, who had nothing to offer but a mere peasant dove. Jesus is advocating for you outsiders, sinners who are broken today. And isn't it telling that Jesus doesn't go to the, Jesus was the only one who's holy enough to enter the Holy of Holies. He's perfect and sinless. He does not go there in most. He goes to the outside of the outside of the temple, utmost outlier of the temple, Gentiles court. He was born outsider, minister to the outsider, goes to the temple for the outsider, and he will die in the outside of the city of Jerusalem as an outsider, naked, complete with nothing left to welcome us outside in to his temple. And that Jesus is not here to just you can judge you and condemn you, but he's also your advocate and savior. Our Lord and Savior is for you, children. Don't just look at him as a role model, but the one who is really there to bleed and die on your behalf, the humble and powerful king who became weak and outsider for you so that we can come to him today. God, I am not what I'm supposed to be. I'm just here going through a bunch of motion today. God, you know the deep sin that I'm struggling today. Can you change me? Is change really possible for me? I've been attending church for years, God, but I'm still struggling with the same thing. Is the change possible? The resounding answer is yes. Go to him about that. And if you feel like you got nothing left, feel like marginalized, weak, and just not able to change, you're at the right place because it is not you who can change you, uh, but the Spirit of God who changes us. So where do you begin? Look to Jesus who fights for you, advocating for you. He was born outsider, lived outsider, died outsider for you so that you, the outsider, can be welcomed in, in his presence. And so that we can really change, move from the fruitless life to truly fruit-bearing life that loves others, serves others, not taking advantage of others, just like Jesus has done unto death. Is that your life today? Or are you just going through the fruitless business today where you examine your life? But as you do that, make sure to do that 
in the presence of God in light of what Jesus said done on the cross. Because if you just see him as an example, it will crush you. But he's not just your example, but he's your advocate and your savior who bled and died for you at the cross of Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Oh God, in one sense, this text is a very challenging text for us. God, am I just going through a fruitless motion? We look like we are doing great today. We are hearing your word. We are singing praise to your name. Are we just doing the right thing externally? But actually, it's fruitless inside of us. God, we look to you to find hope. That powerful God who had audacity to flip the table, that weak and humble, vulnerable for us. God, help us to see you, that your love, so beautiful, not just useful for our agenda. And as you are moved by what you have done for us, God, I pray that you will truly make us more like Jesus today. And we are tired of our sins. This message is not just for those Israelite leaders who are taking advantage of others. Sometimes we do a lot of horrible things in the name of the Lord. We advocate our own righteousness, not yours. What is the disconnect? What is the discrepancy in our lives today? God, will you reveal that to us, any blind spot, so that we can move from this fruitless religiosity to truly fruit-bearing life that becomes more like Jesus day by day? God, we acknowledge that we don't even know how to go about that. So as you tell us today, O oh Lord, we ask, we ask in prayer, Lord. And as we ask, O oh Lord, we look to our Savior, Jesus Christ. Because we are not just coming to you out of our own righteousness, but we see our Savior who bled on the cross for our sins. Jesus, you advocated that much to flip the table and not only just advocate for us, but you've done that sacrificially on the cross. So God, we thank you for saving us and loving us who truly welcomed us so that we can truly know you. We can bear fruit in the likeness of Christ. God, I pray that you change us day by day. In your precious name we pray. Amen.